so, so Stephanie, it's sort of reverse. Stephanie did all the empirical stuff, and I'm going to present the basics of the theory of modern money theory. So what is it? Um, I see it as a framework for analyzing how sovereign currency works and uh, how we define a country that has sovereign currency is one in which the national government chooses the money of account. It issues its own currency denominated in that money of account. It imposes obligations. Today it's mostly taxes, but in the distant past, it was mostly fines and fees payable in its own currency. If it issues other debt, it, those are also made payable in its own currency. That implies that you're floating your currency because if you're pegging, you're promising to deliver something else. Okay. The implications are that you cannot run out of your own currency. You cannot be forced into involuntary default. You can make all payments as they come due. You're not financially constrained. That doesn't mean you don't face constraints. You face resource constraints and you may face political constraints. Stephanie talked about the, some of those. Okay. Uh, and let me just add, you could voluntarily default, which would be very stupid. Occasionally Congress threatens to do that. Okay. But that would be voluntary. So it's not a violation of MMT. Um, the conventional view, I probably most of you studied economics. Okay. So, you know, all this, but uh, just very quickly, uh, it was an exogenous money view. Government controls the money supply uh, with a deposit multiplier. Krugman still believes this. Okay. And he insists MMT has got this completely wrong. And so does Minsky. Um, <laughs> I know not for this kind of work though. Maybe he's okay on trade but you can ignore everything he says about macroeconomics. Anyway, um, so you're supposed to target reserves in order to control the money supply. However, even the mainstream, except for Krugman, has given this up. Okay, now what you're doing is targeting the interest rate to control inflation. What is money? They begin with the barter story. It's to lubricate the market. It's not necessarily that they insist the barter story is true. What they insist is it sheds light on money, what money is. Okay. Um, and then we have specific uh, money denominated assets that fulfill important functions. The most important function is medium of exchange, which goes right back to the barter story. Okay. Barter was inconvenient. So we created money. Um, secondary are means of payment and store of value. So those are not forgotten, but they derive from medium of exchange. That's why money has the other functions. On uh, fiscal policy orthodox views, well, you heard a lot from Stephanie with quotes from the important individuals. Um, in normal times, you want to tax and then spend. Uh, there's a sustainability condition if you decide to also borrow. And that is that the economic growth rate, G, has to be greater than the interest rate, R, or the debt will be unsustainable because it will grow towards infinity. All right. Increasing government spending tends to slow growth and increase the interest rate. So you can see why you'll quickly get into trouble. The debt also burdens the grandkids. They've got to pay it back. So they have to tighten their belts. And so we're going to end up with secular stagnation. Um, there is the alternative. Government can do something that nobody else can do, which is to print money, but that is extremely dangerous because it's the path to um, hyperinflation, Weimar Republic, Zimbabwe, all that stuff. Okay. And Sa Samuelson, for the older people, you know who he is. Uh, he was the Mankiw of his time, although much bigger than Mankiw and actually a serious economist. Okay. Unlike Mankiw. Um, Mankey is a good textbook writer, okay, but not a serious <laughs> Every library is going to have Samuelson. Anyway, he gave an interview, and he's talking about the deficit. The long quote is there. I'm not going to read that. But, uh, you know, he's, he's asked about, do you really need to balance the budget all the time? He says, look, this is like the uh, nursery tales. Are, we tell our children to scare them so they don't wander around in the forest and get eaten by the wolves. Okay, we know it's not true, but we don't trust the politicians. Now, I'm paraphrasing, he didn't state it exactly this way, but that's what it's all about. Economists know you don't need to balance the budget ever, 
but we need to scare them to behave themselves. All right. Oops, sorry. And then uh, uh, Bernanke and um, Greenspan also, I just want to make it clear, they also recognize it's not true. Okay. So when Bernanke uh, is called before Congress, uh, the, the Fed spent and lent $29 trillion to bail out Wall Street. Stephanie talked about the fiscal side. The Fed side was $29 trillion. Clearly, they did not run out of money. Okay. But he was asked, is that taxpayer money you're spending? And he said, no, no, no. We just keystroke it. Okay. Now he's talking about the Fed. But as I'll talk about, the Fed is the Treasury's bank. It's the same way that the Fed spends on behalf of the Treasury. So you cannot run out. So he understands this. And Greenspan was asked, is Social Security really going to go broke? And he said, no, the government can just print money to make all the payments. Okay. So again, this is well understood even by the most mainstream, by central bankers. They understand this. Okay, heterodox approaches. Um, and let me just add, I've had this slide in every presentation in classes when I introduce uh, MMT since about 1999. This is not new. Okay. Um, so uh, the heterodox approach to money, uh, Marx, Keynes, Veblen, Minsky all had a monetary theory of production. Okay. MCM prime for Marx. Veblen called it the theory of business enterprise. They, they all are on the same track. Institutionalists, Devlin and Minsky, money is all bound up with power to do good and to do bad. Money is the most important institution in a capitalist economy. Uh, Jeff Ingham will be talking about money as an institution, I think, after me. Um, Post Keynesian approach tend to emphasize uncertainty, especially Paul Davidson. Uh, above all, and the use of money in contracts as a way to hedge against an uncertain future. So that's the post-Keynesian emphasis. Um, they also started to develop the endogenous money approach uh, in the late 1970s. Uh, the charterless or state money approach of Knapp, Innes, Goodhart, Minsky, uh, I focus on the state's role. So we have state money, and money is all bound up with sovereignty. Um, and finally, functional finance, uh, Lerner and Minsky, state money and government spending. So the role of this, the state's money in fiscal policy. Finally, sectoral balances, Godley and Minsky. You'll notice Minsky is in every one of these. Um, Balance sheets, macro balances, make sure your stock flow consistent, make sure that the balances come out and balance. Okay. All of those together are what I view as modern money theory. So what is modern money theory? It's a synthesis of all of the heterodox approaches. Always has been from the very beginning, no matter how much post Keynesians or other heterodox economists want to criticize us, they have always been included in modern money theory from the very beginning. Okay, uh, I'll say just a, a few things uh, about our um, precursors. Uh, I had read the, the Keynes' Stamps on the Treaties on Money. It's in my 1990 book, all of this stuff here. Uh, money of account comes into existence along with debts, and he distinguished between money and the money of account by saying money of account is the description or title, and money is the thing or we could say the record that answers to the description. Further, the state claims the right to determine what thing corresponds to the name in a various declaration from time to time, when that is to say it claims the right to re-edit the dictionary. So this is the state's right. This right is claimed by all modern states and has been so claimed for some 4,000 years at least. This is where the term modern money comes from, from this quote. Uh, Matt and I were sitting around trying to figure out the title for my book that became Understanding Modern Money back in 97. The publisher gave us some uh, draft titles. We didn't like any of them. And Warren Moser hated all of them. And I said, well, we could use this quote. Sort of an inside joke. It's modern money. What is it about? It's about the way money has been for the past 4,000 years. Before that, we don't know. 
but everything we're saying applies to money for the past 4,000 years, okay? And as we investigated the history, actually, it's true, but it should be 6,000 years. So it's true for the past 6,000 years. Before 6,000 years, we don't know, okay? We don't have evidence for it. Maybe money existed, maybe it was different, but for the past 6,000 years, it has been the way that MMT describes. So anyway, that's where the term came from. All right, Innes had a, a big influence. He said the state, uh, now I am using Keynes's terms uh, in this first quote, uh, not Innes's. But the state enforces the dictionary by imposing a tax liability. Ensuring the money it issues denominated in that unit is generally accepted by agreeing to accept it in tax payments. Taxes drive money. The very nature of credit throughout the world, which is the right of the debtor, sorry, the right of the holder of the credit, the creditor to hand back to the issuer of the debt, the debtor, the latter's acknowledgement or obligation. This is the right of redemption. Okay, these are the two most important concepts. Taxes drive money, money must be redeemed. It is redeemed in taxes. Government money is redeemable by the mechanism of taxation. Farley Grubb will talk tomorrow or the next day about uh, redemption taxes in the American colonies. It's the tax which imparts to the obligation its value. Dollar money is a dollar, not because of the material, but because of the dollar of tax that can be used to redeem it, okay? Innis is the best source that integrates credit money and state money. So that has always been integrated in MMT. Our critics get it wrong. Okay, we never ignored credit money. It's there from the beginning. They both have this characteristic of redemption. What is money? Social unit of measurement, state money of account, designate as money things or money records, the IOUs, debts or liabilities denominated in the money of account. These money things, which is Keynes's term, it's better to say money records because these aren't things you can touch. Okay. Uh, fulfill the traditional functions of money, and then we have uh, Minsky's hierarchy of monies, the pyramid. So the alternative view is use of currency, value of the money are based on the power of the issuing authority, not on the intrinsic value. This has always been true. There never was a stage of commodity money in the past 6,000 years, okay? They are records of debts, whether it is stamped on a gold coin or not, it is just a record of debt. Um, and promises to redeem those debts in tax payments or payments of other obligations to the state. Goodhart wrote uh, three or four different versions of a very nice paper um, in which he said, you know, looking around the world as far back as you go in history and also around the world today, you tend to find this always to be true that every nation has its own currency, rarely violated. There's only one big exception. You all know what it is, okay? Um, several currencies, not a coincidence, tied up with sovereign power, political independence, fiscal authority. So taxes drive money, they impose an obligation payable in the state's own money thing or record. When taxes are paid, both the government and the taxpayer are redeemed. Taxpayer doesn't owe a tax anymore. Government doesn't uh, owe the obligation to take back its own currency anymore. So the redemption is simultaneous. The, the terms are religious because it came out of religion. Uh, and people talk about double entry bookkeeping. I can remember when um, we had to convince Steve Keen that you had to have at least double entry bookkeeping. He argued, no, you don't need that. You actually need quadruple entry bookkeeping when you're talking about money. Okay, the simple model, sovereign spends first the currency into existence and then taxes back. You do not spend tax revenue, you burn it. So Farley Grubb will talk about that. What about bank money? Bank money is a liability issued by banks and endorsed by the state. Uh, that makes them uh, more widely acceptable than they otherwise would be. Firms have to borrow to start the production process. So lending effluxes money, repaying refluxes money. That's the redemption stage. I'm using the terminology of the circuit approach. So if you know the French, Franco-Italian circuit approach, this is the circuit approach, okay? Um, 
Redemption has to follow creation. You cannot be redeemed until the sins have been created. Okay. Uh, the view of the central bank, central bank facilitates payments by and to the state. This was its primary function. This is why central banks were created. Payments by the state efflux money, taxes reflux money. So again, using the circuit approaches terminology. Uh, taxes do not finance government spending. Taxes are for redemption not for spending purposes. Bonds do not finance the deficit. It's already been financed by an efflux of central bank money. So bond sales are part of a reflux. They're not part of spending. The deficit is exposed after the reflux of taxes. So you spend first, you collect taxes. If you don't collect all of the uh, currency that was spent, then we record that as a deficit. Bond issues are functionally part of monetary policy, not a borrowing operation. Uh, this was Warren Moser's uh, great contribution to MMT to recognize that it doesn't matter whether it's the central bank or the treasury that is selling bonds, it is monetary policy. They, they serve the same function. They reduce reserves. So what is quantitative easing? Removing bonds and paying interest on reserves. So uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, Paul Sheard talk about uh, QE, QE, complete nonsense. You know, all you're doing is uh, having the Fed pay the interest rather than having the treasury pay the interest. Why would you expect that to be stimulating? All right, um, now modern governments don't spend their currency into existence. Okay. After the creation of central banks, we have two degrees of separation between the treasury and the population. So the government treasury uses the central bank and you all use a private bank. So those are the two degrees of separation. There's a central bank and a private bank that come between you and the treasury. When the treasury spends, the central bank credits the reserves of your bank. The bank then credits your demand deposits. When you pay your taxes, it's just reversed. Your bank debits your demand deposit and the Fed debits your bank's reserves. So the efflux and the reflux runs through the banking system. The two degrees of separation are so confusing for economists that they get it all wrong. It was very obvious in the American colonies, there's no way people could pay taxes until the colonies spent the currency. It was obvious. They called them redemption taxes. Everyone knew what the purpose was. You don't spend tax revenue. But now it's all hidden because there's two degrees of separation. And that boggles the minds of economists, okay? So they think the government has to have the tax revenue before it spends which of course is nonsense and impossible. So MMT says you spend then tax and uh, you've all read Stephanie's book, so you know this very well. Um, you cannot take out what you have not put in. Taxes are paid by debiting bank reserves. There's only, uh, the only sources of reserves are treasury spending, central bank purchases or lending. You have to put the reserves in before they can be taken out. Taxes cannot be paid without debiting reserves. The reserves have to be put into the banks first. So you have to put the reserves into the hat. Um, now, presumably everybody who studied economics knows that injections have to come before leakages. Okay? Well, at least if you use the Samuelson textbook, maybe if you use the MenQ. <laughs> this isn't taught at all, I don't know. Um, and, you know, the, the way it's usually said is investment creates saving. That's the Keynesian notion. That was a revolution of thought against the loanable funds hypothesis uh, that Keynes had made in 1936. Investment creates saving. All right. What we're saying is, of course, completely analogous to that. Government spending creates the income that can be leaked into taxes. Okay, they, these are identical statements. Injection first, then leakage. Again, boggles the minds of economists, including 
almost all of our post-Keynesian friends. They think we got it wrong. They will all agree, oh yeah, of course, investment first, then saving. You say, well, it has to be true of government spending too. Government first, then taxes. Boggles their minds, can't follow it. It's the same logic. There's no such thing as deficit spending. All spending takes the form of keystroke credits. All tax payments take the form of keystroke debits. This is true whether there will be a deficit, surplus, or balanced budget at the end of the year. The deficit is ex post. You won't know if there's going to be a deficit till the end of the year. Okay. Um, it is not discretionary. Stephanie already dealt with that in the uh, empirical discussion. It's not discretionary. The government budget constraint is not a constraint at all. It's an ex post identity. Okay. At the end of the year, we will see that it will be true that government spending is equal to tax revenue plus the change in the bond holdings plus the change in reserve holdings. HPM is high powered money. Also Minsky's initials. Uh, so I tend to use that instead of monetary base. Um, uh, so it cannot be a constraint on spending. It is just a, a ex post identity. The sustainability condition, interest rates below the growth rate, is not a solvency constraint. Government can make all payments as they come due. And in any case, out of all these variables in the budget constraint and the solvency condition, there's only one variable that is discretionary, and it is the interest rate. So we can always have the interest rate below the growth rate because we have complete discretion over the interest rate. And it's the only variable in that equation that we have complete discretion over. So all we have to do is set the interest rate below the growth rate. Okay. Uh, so even if we didn't do that, there's no solvency constraint. But what I'm saying is we can prevent the debt ratio from going to infinity simply by lowering the interest rate below the growth rate. The danger is excess spending, not excess money. Government spending takes only one form. Uh, Congress, Parliament, depending on the, the political arrangements, authorizes spending. Treasury cuts the checks. Central bank clears them by crediting reserves. There's no independence in this. Central banks can't say no. They clear accounts. Okay, they're not going to bounce a Treasury check. Budgetary outcomes known only ex post. Stephanie always says cash registers don't discriminate. Too much spending, whether government or private, can cause inflation. True inflation, by Keynes's definition, only exists beyond full employment. You can get semi-inflation before full employment because you have bottlenecks and so on. And COVID is a very good example of high inflation, way below full employment. Um, so anyway, uh, you can get prices rising. Keynes said it's best not to fight that. Okay, and it's very doubtful that austerity is going to be useful. I'm not going to go through the Japan example. Um, godly sectoral balances, you've heard this twice already today. At the aggregate level, the sum of surpluses equals the sum of the deficits because income has to equal spending at the aggregate level. This is assured by national income accounting. For one sector to run a surplus, at least one other must run a deficit. So the household balance plus the government balance plus the corporate balance plus the rest of the world balance has to sum to zero. The country with a current account deficit, which is the United States and by some kind of strange coincidence, English speaking nations run current account deficits, um, cannot reduce the deficit unless the domestic sectors surplus falls or the current account moves toward a surplus and policymakers do not have control over either of those other balances which means they don't have control over the deficit it's not discretionary you don't need to see that again uh, it's often been claimed that japan is um, following mmt policy because they have huge deficits <laughs> biggest deficits in the uh, at least the rich world for 30 years now right um, our uh, answer is no, Japan is not following MMT recommendations at all. Uh, MMT is not a proposal to ramp up deficits. Uh, it follows uh, learner's functional finance approach. Budgeting should be functional. To, to pursue 
the goals. And we think full employment, moderate inflation, sustainable growth, greater equality, environmental sustainability are the most important goals. Focus on those, not on the size of the deficit. Japan has run high deficits and debt, not because it's following MMT, but because it follows precisely the opposite. What Japan tends to do is uh, if the economy starts to recover from long-term secular stagnation, they raise the consumption tax because they want to reduce the deficit. That slows the economy, so the deficit increases. They do it time after time after time. This is not MMT policy. But the Japanese experience validates core MMT arguments concerning sovereign deficits and debt. It shows that mainstream uh, theory is wrong. Deficits need not lead to inflation. Japan's problem, of course, is deflation. They don't have an inflation problem. Bond markets cannot uh, force uh, default. The interest rate is largely a policy variable under the central bank control, okay? So uh, deficits and huge debt ratios do not drive up the interest rate. They don't necessarily drive up inflation. They don't lead to bond market attacks on the treasury. Resources, not finance, is the true constraint. Uh, tackling multiple pandemics that we face comes down to mobilizing unemployed resources, shifting those already employed, and creating new ones. How do we shift them? Taxes, postponed consumption, patriotic saving, rationing, regulations. We have used all of those in the past, mostly in World War II. We used all of those in order to shift resources to the government sector. Spending then allocates resources desired to achieve the public purpose. Taxing releases resources to be used in pursuit of the public purpose. Conclusion, how are we gonna pay for multiple pandemics? I'm not just talking about COVID, I'm talking about inequality, poverty, unemployment, homelessness, environmental catastrophe, forever wars, okay. Um, no change of procedures is required. We don't have to find some special way. Uh, when the pandemic hit, people said, oh, well now we'll do what MMT says, fly helicopters and drop money into the economy. It's a new way of spending that MMT discovered. Well, that's not true. There is no new way of spending. We say we already have all the procedures we need to spend 5 trillion if you want to, which is what we did. Um, so all we have to do is authorize the spending, central bank, treasury, know how to finance it. The ultimate constraint is resources, not finance. The budgetary outcome is neither discretionary nor worrying. Interest rates are determined by central bank policy, not by markets. Inflation can be avoided by policy focused on mobilizing resources and releasing them as necessary. I know you're going to be very interested in what about inflation today. So those topics will be covered later. Uh, I'm not going to do them now. That is it. I have no idea how we're doing on time. But that doesn't mean anything because I don't remember the schedule. When is it? <laughs> when are we supposed to be done? 11 15. We, we got two minutes. We, we can go a, a, a few minutes. Um, I can take a, a couple of questions. Yeah. You said that, uh, so ours, the rate is discretionary. Uh, it has to be less than G for it to be meet that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this is not generally the case over a long period of time, but G is negative, like substantially yeah. negative. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be difficult to target, like, basically. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, uh, the interest rate we normally think has a zero bound. Okay. Uh, wh what do you do? You use fiscal policy, you get the G up. Okay. We can uh, increase uh, the, uh, the role of the state in spending, employing people, and so on in order to get the growth rate above the interest rate. So yes, if G is negative, a zero rate, uh, uh, the debt is not sustainable in neoclassical terms, but who cares? I mean, your problem is you've got to you know, get out of the recession, get, get growth positive, yeah. What would be the connection between the zero rate policy and then, you know, Professor Kelton tells the story of, of, of uh, well, do you want to get rid of the debt? Yes. And then later, let's get rid of the treasuries. Well, no, we need to have treasuries because, you know, for all the reasons she gave. So if on the one hand, the zero rate is really the pop, should be the policy rate, 
but then what you've done is you got rid of treasuries. So what what's the implication there? Okay, we are going to talk about permanent ZERP as a policy, and we're going to talk about whether we should get rid of treasuries. Okay, so I don't really want to go into those. It's actually a panel we're going to do. Um, but you don't need treasuries to keep the rate above zero. The Fed can pay interest, you know, which is what we decided. The, the Fed could not pay interest until um, 2007, sometime around there, the Fed was prohibited to pay interest on reserves. Uh, the Fed had been trying for probably decades uh, to get authority from Congress to change the Federal Reserve Act to let them pay interest on reserves. They wanted to do it. And the crisis gave them the opportunity. So they finally got it. And so now we can always have the rate above zero if the Fed wants it to be. Yeah. Uh, everything you explained to us this presentation was how the economics or the situation of what in a country is So my question is, what is an NMT if everything you said is a description? Because we can use description to every policy we want, to war, to industrialization or everything. So what is the MMT? Is it John Monty or can it be everything? So this is my question because it is a description of reality. So everything can be MMT if this is reality. Yeah. So well, yeah. Our view is that our first step is to tell people how the world works. Okay? We think it's useful for policymakers to know how the world works. Whether they're Republican, Democrat, you know, whatever, they should understand how it works. Okay, and then in a democratic nation we should have representatives that represent the population and they should do what the population wants them to do, okay? And they will be much more successful if they understand how the world works than if they don't, okay? You know, there's gravity out there. Isn't it worthwhile to understand that gravity works? You know, I think it's also worthwhile to understand how does the government really spend, all right? Uh, and then we'll start making policy based on reality rather than based on unreality, which is the government could run out of money. Are there specific MMT policies? Um, I think that there, there is one you mentioned, job guarantee follows directly. It has always been an MMT. I think it's necessary. And we're going to have a lot of discussion of the job guarantee, including why it's necessary, especially from Bill Mitchell. Okay. Um, so taxes drive money, but they don't determine the value of money. So we need an anchor. Okay. So job guarantee. Uh, we need to float the currency. Floating exchange rate is an important um, policy of MMT. Uh, because if you don't float the exchange rate, you, you may be okay. We're not saying every country has to float the exchange rate, but if you don't, then you will constrain your domestic policy. It may be worthwhile for some countries to do that. All right. And then the final one is you set your interest rate. Now, when we started MMT, that was controversial because the mainstream still thought the central bank determines the money supply. Okay, but now pretty much everybody is on board. Central banks set the interest rate, okay? And with NMMT, we tend to want a low interest rate or a zero interest rate, okay? Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that there, you know, there's absolutely only one MMT view on what the interest rate should be. There isn't, all right? I guess I, guess I can do one more. Yeah, um, so I was really interested about the, um money at 6,000 years portion. And so I was curious, uh, I know David Graeber has wrote a little bit on this. And so did that uh, you know, research really just foundate itself in the idea that written records go back around 6,000 years so we can't really like figure that out? Because I, I'm interested, especially because a lot of the anthropology right now is coming up with like human domestication theory and how egalitarian we may or may not have been. So I'm, I'm really interested in seeing if there's like new research that 
and the problems are connecting with MMP in that way like the six thousand years before. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the problem is writing. Writing was invented by accountants to keep track of money. And so that's as far back as we can go and be sure. Okay, so we have some evidence and, and it, I think it's probably true that it's older. Okay, but uh, they, uh, we have not found written evidence of it. We, we have found some scratches in, in rocks and so on. Okay, and that could have been accounting for money, but we don't know for sure. So that's why I'm, I'm not willing to make a bigger claim. I, I, I think I have to stop. Now, 